Yes, this is me with Michael Jackson. <laughs> About 20 years ago, when I first started as a professional photographer in New York, I was lucky enough to be able to photograph the likes of Michael, Jonathan Franson, Peyton Manning, and a whole bunch of other really seriously famous people. But what people didn't understand at that time was I was struggling with heavy drinking, and I'd also started dabbling in drugs. When I look at this picture of me with Tony Bennett, you might think I look okay, or if you look closely, I look a little tired. But in reality, I was covering up so much. I was going through such a struggle at that time, and I was trying to hide it from everyone. Because I'd gone from dabbling with drugs to serious heroin use and using crack cocaine. A lot of photographers, a lot, sorry, photographers, a lot, a lot of addicts can be functional at that time, and I was, I was doing pretty well. I was hiding it from friends, I was managing to work, I was keeping it under control as much as I could, but I knew I had a really big problem. I wanted to stop using, but I really didn't know how. So I'm Susan. I first met Graham at a beach house in Montauk in the summer of 2002. He seemed like a charming Scottish guy, kind of the life of the party, but not someone I would have gotten involved with because it was pretty clear he was using too much or drinking too much. We lost touch after that summer, but I emailed him a few years later, almost on a whim, when I needed an author photo taken for a book I'd written. In this contact sheet from that photo shoot, I look a bit haggard, but Graham actually seemed like he was doing a lot better. He told me he'd quit drinking, and after a very flirtatious afternoon, he asked me out on a date. We started seeing each other, and it turned out Graham was quite the romantic, sending me photos of himself. This was long before the era of selfies. <laughs> making me CDs and asking if, we wanted to, if I wanted to go on holiday with him. He had all these frequent flyers miles saved up, and he managed to somehow score two business class tickets to Hawaii at the last minute. In these pictures from that trip, Graham actually looks really healthy. When my mom saw them, she actually described him as wholesome. But what I didn't know was that during that trip, he was using methadone, so he wouldn't go into withdrawal. It wasn't until a couple months after we got back that I realized he was using heroin and crack. But it really wasn't obvious, unlike when he was drinking. He just didn't fit the image I had of a junkie. My habit eventually led to Susan and I breaking up, which was really upsetting to me. But we were still friends, we were still hanging out and doing things together, so I was determined in my mind that I could get clean and I could prove to her that I was going to be okay. I'd managed to stop drinking, I'd pretty much managed to stop using the heroin, but I was using crack still, and it kept dragging me back down that rabbit hole, you know, it was a very self-destructive time. But I kept using that phrase, relapse is part of recovery. I'd heard it mentioned a few times by different people, and I was using it as a crutch to justify keeping using, keeping falling back into that habit, and it was keeping me trapped. In December 2006, there was an accident in my apartment. The police came and arrested me because they found drug paraphernalia in my apartment and sent me to Rikers Island for a couple of days. That was sort of devastating, but a real eye-opener to me. But the worst thing that happened was that the local newspaper featured a, that ran a front-page piece on it as if it was like some big issue. But it was traumatizing to me because what happened was that this thing I'd been hiding and this thing that I'd been sort of skirting around was out in the public. The friends knew, neighbors knew, family knew. It was really devastating to me. So I got a call saying that Graham had been arrested, and at first I was so angry about it, I just had that reaction that I wanted to leave him in jail for a couple days so he could think about the consequences of his actions. But his parents were far away in Scotland, and they were really upset about the idea of him spending Christmas in jail. So I said I'd go bail him out. And the truth is, you just don't leave someone sitting in Rikers Island. Graham had to go back to court many, many times, so occasionally for a while I'd show up just to make sure he was make, getting good legal advice. It was pretty clear he was using and using heavily at that point, and sometimes he was really out of it. He just not out in the middle of the courtroom. Other times he was quite lucid, and he told me how much he appreciated my help, like when he brought me this card and a bunch of flowers on Valentine's Day. Those kinds of gestures made me feel like I was doing the right thing. But I'd also been to some support group meetings and picked up flyers like this one, and I'd heard all about enabling and codependency and tough love, and those kinds of things made me feel conflicted. But once Graham was involved with the criminal justice system, I just didn't feel like I could walk away and leave him totally on his own. We know a lot more now about how drugs affect someone's brain chemistry, but even back then it was clear that he just wasn't capable of navigating his legal situation. He just wasn't able to think rationally. 
I was still pretty much in denial at this point. I was still using, I was still thinking that people didn't know I was covering it up, you know, but I was getting drawn deeper and deeper in, even though I knew I needed help. So I reached out to try and find rehab or detox, but at that point, I didn't have any medical insurance. I didn't have any money. I couldn't afford it. And everything that I was being offered was like one or two days here or an outpatient program there. That just wasn't enough for me. I needed something really serious and really intense that was going to really help me. So I kept using, I kept getting arrested, I kept cycling through the criminal justice system with no real consequences to my behavior. I was getting put back out in the street and nobody was offering me any help. Finally, you know, I couldn't work anymore. I wasn't making any money. I couldn't pay my mortgage. I lost my house. I pushed everyone who cared about me, including Susan, out of my life. I ended up living in the projects, the worst place for someone for me to be. I just surrounded myself with people that was going to enable me and keep me going down that same path. In December, in, yeah, this, no, May 2006, sorry, 2010, I finally got arrested one more time, and this time they sent me to Rikers Island. They sentenced me to six months. That really blew me away because I wasn't really aware of what was going on when I copped out. I was like detoxing. They put me in Rikers Island. I detoxed in a really cold, dark cell. But by the time I got out of it, I was sort of drug-free a little bit. I put my head down, I got a job, I went to the yard, I cleaned up my act, I avoided the drugs that were in there. I was starting feeling good after a few months. I thought, you know, this is the foundation I need. I can get out there and start rebuilding my life. But it didn't quite work out that way. By the time that I heard that Graham had spent the summer in Rikers Island, it was late August, around the time he was supposed to be released. But instead of getting out, he ended up getting picked up by immigration. And when I looked up his status online and saw that, that was pretty scary news for me. I hadn't seen him in over a year at that point, but I knew he was in really big trouble and I at least wanted to make sure he had a good lawyer. Um, so after many, many efforts and phone calls and sending letters that didn't ever get to him, I managed to track him down to this prison in Pennsylvania and even more amazingly managed to get a clerk at the prison to give him this message with my number. He still has that piece of paper. <laughs> People sometimes ask me why I was still help, willing to help Graham, and I think if you don't have personal experience with jail or prison, it can be tough to appreciate how helpless and isolated inmates are, and in some cases, how badly they're treated. So when you care about someone who's in that situation, you do just about anything to get them free. But it wasn't until I actually spoke with Graham that I realized there was this other factor kind of drawing me in, and it was that the first time I'd ever spoken with him, and he was completely sober and clean. By that point, I'd been in immigration detention for about three weeks. I'd been moved from Rikers Island through New York to New Jersey, and finally this place in Pennsylvania where they hold immigrants. No one was telling me what was going on. There was a real lack of information. I didn't even know if people on the outside knew where I was at that point. This is a drawing that I did in the dormitory where I was kept, you know. We were crammed in, really tightly packed. The showers and the toilets were open. There was no privacy. We got no outdoor space whatsoever. And it was really freezing. People were walking around with blankets wrapped on them like this. You know, there was a multitude of different languages going on. It was, it, it was starting to make Rikers Island seem like the Hilton Hotel. So now you realize how bad it was. That's how I felt. I was at the point where I was thinking, you know what, I'm going to sign out and just go back to Scotland because I can't take this anymore. But once I spoke to Susan, she said to me, the consequences of that can be really bad, and I should reevaluate that once I speak to a judge. So after, and the other thing was, I had a son here in New York, and I just couldn't bear the thought of leaving him behind if I got deported, because I knew I'd never be able to come back again. Around that same time, I found out there was a rehab program within the prison, but it was for county inmates. And somehow I used a little bit of my Scottish charm or whatever it was to talk my way onto that rehab program because they didn't take immigrants. And it was a 24-7, living, 16-week cognitive behavioral therapy program with individual meetings, group counseling. It was everything you could imagine. It was hard in the beginning. It was intense. But I knew deep down inside this is what I really needed. So I embraced it because I saw this as a way of getting moving forward in a really progressive, positive manner. That program's impact on Graham was pretty profound. I could see that he was changing kind of week by week. Most of our phone calls were taken up with the details of his immigration case, and since they cost about a dollar a minute, we had to keep them quite brief. 
So we started writing each other these letters. You know, one Graham sent me was about 13 pages. And that was how we kind of reconnected and hashed out what had happened over the previous few years. I could start to feel that connection with him again. So by the time his lawyer asked if Graham could stay with me if he managed to win his case and got released, I said yes, which was a pretty big leap of faith for me. I'm skipping over a lot of the stress involved in actually winning his case, but in January 2011, an immigration judge overturned Graham's deportation order. He was released, and he came to stay with me. I have no doubt that the treatment he got in prison was key to him ab being able to stay clean, and a lot of what he learned from that program actually rubbed off on me, so it was really rewarding to be part of that process, but especially to see Graham reconnect with his family, his brother and sister in Dublin, his mom and dad in Scotland, and his son Liam in Brooklyn, who had grown into a young man who was remarkably accepting and forgiving. You might think I was crazy to do everything I did for Graham, but when I look at these pictures of all these people who got Graham back into their lives, I know that what I did for him would have been worth it, even if we hadn't ended up back together. Getting those people back in my life was really tough, you know. As an addict, I wanted it to happen really quickly. I wanted instant gratification. I was clean, come back into my life. But it didn't quite work like that. It took time, and I had to back off and let people come to me at their pace and really embrace me in their own time. But what was more tricky was the fact that I'd been out of work for a while. I hadn't worked as a photographer. I had a criminal record. There was a whole bunch, a decade of chaos behind me, and I didn't know how I was going to earn a living, and I didn't know how I was going to be able to even pay my rent. But luckily, I got a part-time job teaching at an art school, which was really brilliant, because that's where I started off as a photographer in an art school, and that was really instrumental in getting me back on my feet again. Some of the photographs you've seen in this slideshow come from a series that I took while I was an addict. I had a little point-and-shoot camera that I kept recording things around me all the time, and after debating it for a little while, I decided to publish them. I published them in New York Magazine, and I published them in The Guardian in the UK. It was a, it was a hard decision coming out so publicly, really, but in the end, it was really useful. It opened a lot of doors to people to talk to me, and you know, eventually they were bought by the National Portrait Gallery in Scotland. Susan and I eventually wrote a memoir, which you know about probably, and we got involved in a lot more speaking engagements, talking about prison, addiction, recovery, and that was really rewarding because the more I opened up, people started opening up to me about their own, issue, their own experiences with addiction or family members and stuff like that. So that was really, really key and important for me moving on and embracing other people to talk about this as well. I've been clean now for seven years and it's been totally rewarding, but I can say that I couldn't have done it without opening up so much for people and sharing with people and also just, you know, the help of everyone around me. I couldn't have gone down this road and got so far as I have gotten without the help of so many other people, including Susan. <laughs> At first, I was a bit hesitant about being so public about what had happened to Graham, but the more we've talked about it, the more I realize how important it is to be having these conversations, whether it's at dinner or public events like this, because that's the only way we're going to bring addiction out of the shadows and sort of address the stigma that surrounds it right now. Just to bring it back to Tony Bennett, Graham and I saw this docu uh, the documentary about Amy Winehouse, and Tony Bennett was one of the people interviewed. And this quote from him really stuck with me, because at the end of the day, life did sort of teach us how to get through this, and sort of by the same token, I think that people like Graham have a lot to teach us, not just about addiction, but especially about recovery. According to the best estimates that I could find, there are about 25 million people in the U.S. who are in recovery from substance use disorders. Everybody's path is different, but I think they all have a lot to teach us about how they got sober or clean. Thank you. Thank you very much.